think you can beat me in soybeans? Forget about it. We do have two tropical storms or hurricanes coming in the Gulf. May get a lot of wind, a lot of rain, so who knows what's going to happen. You know, I'm a sixth generation farmer. Can I keep expanding? What can I do? What am I not doing right? I'm confirmed sixth generation farmer. It's fresh, pretty thin right now, it's just that time of year. It's not gonna be hard to beat Weaver. He's not even in my realm of thoughts. Like, pick out the worst plant. That should be how Weaver's crap looks. So we're cutting some Agrigold 37 beans. Doing about 80 bushel to the acre right now. We're in Finksburg, Maryland. Right there in Central Carroll County. It looks like Saturday it's gonna rain. We all know one thing, test weight on beans will drop as the rain keeps going. So we're trying to get as much beans cut before the rain hits. You know, I got Nathan, he's planting small grain. We do a lot of rye for Sagamore rye whiskey, so he's out planting rye. So I'm a little short-handed today. Uh, Dad will be back here in a few hours, but it's just me cutting right now and running truck and doing everything by myself. You know, the one thing we had plenty of was sunshine. The one thing we lacked was rainfall. And as my good buddy Cobb will tell you, you cannot ever beat Mother Nature. She is the boss. I'm always talking to the fertilizer company and saying, hey, what's new? What's different? We're using a lot of carbon, a lot of sugar. Monty's carbon is, I'd say, without a shadow of a doubt, the best humic that's on the market. When this goes back next year, what we're going to do is we're going to come back in and spray it with some more humix as soon as we're done. We are going through all of our bean ground this year and we're putting on a cover crop. Uh, we're using different cover crops on different fields, different areas, changing it up a little bit differently than what we've done in the past. We get a lot of beans that lodge or wall over, and it's just because we're pushing them pretty hard throughout the year that we're trying to maximize the most bushels we can out of them. And I always like the head just to kind of flow down, you know, and let the head do all the work. You know, some directions they cut a little bit better than others, and sometimes you're always just readjusting. You know, I'm a sixth generation farmer. You know, that puts a lot of stress on me and anybody else that is. I mean, you know, Kevin and Brooks, we've discussed this. And, you know, in lower commodity prices, you get nervous. Am I going to be the one to have to stop farming or lose the farm? Or can I keep expanding? What can I do? What am I not doing right? However, you know, when it comes to the team, I'm pretty blessed. My dad and Uncle Tom. I tell you, I don't know where I'd be without him because he really makes me think out of the box at 73. You know, Ed on beans, Ed takes a lot of extreme ownership in helping me on beans and Nathan with planting them. You know, I can't be everywhere and do everything. You gotta have a good team behind you, not just on the farm, but talk to. You know, I'm very blessed. I got Terry Vissing, I got Kevin Cobb, I got Brooks Cardinal that we're talking all the time. What are you doing different than I'm doing? How did this work? Joe Debman with Monty's. I'm probably on the phone with him and Paul Miles three to four times a week saying, hey, I need this, or what do you think about this? And we were just discussing where we started out in this journey and where we've been. And, you know, I failed more than we've been successful. The first time I remember a seed rep coming out to the farm saying, oh, you guys are on track for 150 bushel beans. They yielded 70. You know, that was pretty depressing. But the takeaway was 
over the whole field, that monitor stayed on 70. I don't want to grow 140 bushel beans or 130 bushel beans just on an acre. How do we do it over the entire field? How do we do it on the entire farm? We're kind of coming into this little awkward here, so we're getting a little bit of hang up with these beans right now. Give me a sec. Yep, we're good. I just need to keep feeding them in. They're jamming up on that one corner. They don't like that corner today. Hey, when I ask you a question, say Kevin Cobb. Hey, Charlie. Hey, hold on. Charlie, who's your favorite corn warrior? Kevin Cobb. Kevin Cobb? You know, I'm, I'm very blessed to have a great family, dad, mom, but you know, I wouldn't be where I am today no matter what if it wasn't for my wife, Megan, and my two kids. You guys wanna ride with me? Good, let's go! I got together with them. We've got a pop-up blend and there's some special stuff in it and I made it specifically for this. With Monty's we have trusted advisors and we get that relationship. Working with Temple on this field of beans, we've got a very good root development. I mean, that's awesome looking. Monty's carbon, I wouldn't farm if I couldn't use that. So what kind of crap is Weaver telling you? He, I saw him on Facebook Live the other day. He wanted to run his mouth, say that I'm taking naps over here, can't get my work done. Uh-huh. Yeah, but seriously though, think about that. I, like I told him the other day, if you, you're my consultant and you don't beat me, how embarrassing would that be? Way drier than I thought. We're going to run. All right. Thank you, Rhonda. You want this back? No, I'll donate them to the calls. <laughs> Look at all, you've got, you've seen all different soil types. You want to talk about somebody that's got the, probably the worst dirt? That whole area for a weaver to be picking 200 some bush of corner there is pretty amazing. See how many rocks are in the ground? It's almost like all gravel. And it's amazing to me that you can grow that kind of crop on that kind of dirt. Like I would, honestly, if there was a farm came up like that around here, I'd go look at it, look at the dirt, and I'm like, I'm out. I'm not, I don't want it. I'm gone. Who's growing that kind of crop on that dirt? And I've seen it. Like I went over and and looked through those fields before, and it's like I don't get it. In that area, there is a lot of really good ground. Their dry land over there is like our irrigated. Yeah, they they put up big numbers. Let me get on this right now. Hey, Dad, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Thirteen seven. You go. Okay. <laughs> Gonna have to. Yeah, 81 years old. Still got to be a jokester all the time. When we were cutting wheat, that entire farm, I planted it, and the very next day, we got four inches of rain, and it drowned in all them beans. We couldn't get back on the dirt. Never got back on the ground until July 12th or 15th. I mean, it was terrible. We went back down there, we replanted them. We got another two inches of rain on top of it right after I replanted them. We tried to go back in there and I was gonna replant them again. And I was like, man, it's just, it's a shot in the dark. 
put a bunch of fungicide on the ground, put some root stimulator in there, try to get them back going again, try to get them revived, what was there. I think our final stand was like 120,000 maybe down there. They ended up still doing a decent average. I mean, it wasn't great, but they were double crop beans behind wheat and where they were still in the mid 40s. So, I mean, it wasn't bad, but they literally, they were only about, I don't know, 16 inches tall. They were full of pods, but they were only about 16 inches tall. They were tiny. I mean, they just, I was really upset, but they were, that was 200 and, I think it was like 225 acres that had to be replanted on that farm. That's how much rain we had. I mean, it just, it wouldn't stop. Like it would not stop. The ground, it was, it, it literally smelled sour like marsh mud all year long. And it just, it's never stopped for us. Every rain that comes, like they'll be like, oh, you're gonna get, you know, you get a half inch of rain and we'd get two inches. And they'd be like, oh, we're gonna get four tenths. We'd get three inches. And it just, I think, in the month of August over here, we got like 20 couple inches of rain. So anyway, we just fought that problem and it just, you know, when, that, when a crop gets that wet of a foot, it's like you can't come out of it. Like as we get done cutting beans now, what we do is we cut the beans, we immediately f f um, put a cover crop in and then we go get the ditcher and then we ditch the whole field. We'll clean out all the ditches so that over the winter, it'll drain out so when it comes springtime, we don't lay extremely wet where we can actually actually do something and get out there. It got to be, we fought it so bad. We cut ruts when we sprayed this year. We just, it, I've never fought this hard, this long on a wet year. Like it, it started kind of wet. We were late planting. I mean, we didn't plant those beans in the contest till June 1st. And the, that rain was creating such a problem. We were losing, losing, losing ground because we could not never make it up. Like the plant really couldn't even absorb what it needed to do and get going and it would revert right back. You need to go anywhere you ride this dirt bike around. What the hell was it? Hey, don't be me. I got my chicken house clothes on. I look like a bum. You look like a bum every day anyway. Oh, what's up? That's awesome. I'm a, I'm gonna leave this right here. <laughs> All right, let's get in the combine. Let's go. Revitech is a brand new product from BASF. We're really excited for that. Revitech is going to be able to help growers stretch yields more than they have in the past. The number one name of the game should be reducing stress. You reduce stress, you increase yield. I'm excited about Revitech. We use it on every acre. We're looking at upwards of 60 days control. It's going to take great farmers and just propel them so much further than we've ever been before. Uncle Tom loves the show Corn Warriors. So he's got my daughter Mackenzie, who's six, and my son Charlie, who's four, both now loving it. As the two of them are watching it, they'll say, that's my buddy Kevin Cobb. That's my buddy Brooks. And what really cracks me up is now Mackenzie knows every word to the new theme song. And when she's having a bad day going into school, she makes me play it on YouTube. He goes, well, I know if I'm listening to it, so is Kevin. I think he hums it all day long to himself. And that's what I do. So if Cobb hasn't brainwashed Uncle Tom, he's done a phenomenal job of brainwashing my two kids. This year, we were pretty humbled to have some of the best yielding beans I've ever had in uh, 12, 13 years of doing this. I was going 0.7 miles an hour 
and they were feeding in so quick I took my eyes off the head for one second. I broke this shaft off the spline of the auger reel. One of those things that I wanted to show everybody that it can happen and doesn't matter how well you prepare for it, we ripped it right off. We got 64 acres of beans left to roll, but we're gonna stop over here and look at some rye that's being grown for the distillery. This is actually rye being grown for Sagamore Distillery, one of the largest whiskey distillers in Maryland. Most farmers, we grow corn and beans and we don't get to see it go all the way through. I get to see our rye being malted and then going into whiskey production, then get to taste the fruits of our labor into the whiskey. We also grow another type of rye for miscellaneous distillery, which we'll go down there later today and tour it. I live in Carroll County, Maryland, and Dan is a Carroll County distiller. He gets his corn and his rye from us. So it really lets me feel like I'm part of the whole operation. We use Monty's products on it all, so we know it's healthy and going into the, as I like to say, the drinking supply. I know Cobb likes his beer, but I'm gonna tell you something, nothing's better in a winter day than having a nice glass of whiskey and especially one that you know that we started the rye and we did the corn production on. One of the things that we're doing is because we want to increase organic matter, we've introduced it in our rotation, is we harvest in July. A lot of people would try to say, why don't you run back through a no-till double crop beans? What we found in rye production, we blow the straw back on, and then the other part, we'll plant a crimson clover, radish, sunflower mix. And then what we're really seeing in the next several years is our organic matter levels are increasing in these fields to go back into corn production. We got a ring for booze, guys. Come on in. So my name is Dan McNeil. I'm the co-owner and distiller here at Miscellaneous Distillery in Mount Airy, Maryland. We make everything from uh, rums, vodka, gin, and whiskeys, and the whiskeys we use are grain inputs from Hickory Hollow Farms right up there in Finksburg. So today I'm gonna to show you guys around the facility and show you what goes into our product. First, we always say hi to our dog, Jamie. So everything starts here at Josie Wales. Josie Wales is a 350 gallon uh, tote that we use for our mashing, our fermentation, and our distillation of our whiskey. If it's our rye, it's gonna be 100% rye grain that goes in. If it's our bourbon, we do 51% corn and 49% rye. And if it's uh, our corn whiskey, it's gonna be 100% corn. We'll slowly add in the grain, emulsifies everything, mixes it up, and gets a nice even cook on it. So we'll let that sit for an hour and a half, converting the starch in that grain to a sugar. And then we'll go ahead and start cooling it down so we can add in the yeast, which will then turn those sugar strands that we've created into alcohol. And then we're gonna have something that's about 7% alcohol at the end of it. Alcohol is a lower boiling point than water or solids, so that alcohol is gonna evaporate up this column at 173 degrees and recondense, and we'll get about 45 gallons at 40% alcohol. We'll do a secondary distillation on our products. This is where we go ahead and eliminate the bad byproducts that occur naturally in every fermentation. After we've created all that nice, beautiful whiskey, it's all clear when it comes off the still. We want to impart some sort of color and an additional flavor to it. So it all goes into new white American oak casks uh, with a char level three on the inside. So uh, we have these sitting here for anywhere between six months on the smallest size, which is a five gallon around the corner, all the way up to these Big guys here are 53 gallons. They're gonna sit there for well over four years. As you're going through, just remember, Cobb has beer, Weaver has whiskey. Now whose friend do you really wanna be? One of the better products that we've seen come out here lately is Veltima from BASF. The thing I like about this is how long it's gonna last in that plant. It can give me a longer window to make that decision. I'm really loving it. Veltima has the longest residual of any product out there. 
let's control something that we're able to control this year. Veltima reduces stress in the plant, reduces the temperature, happy corn makes more grain. We're actually going to, maybe, if we don't break down, we might get done before Thanksgiving. Yeah, I broke the whole, um, the, all the bearings out of the front of the draper belt went out. It's just, we've been running so long, running all this mud does not help. The, I had put um, bearings in the other draper head three days ago, and then this one goes out. I'm like, really? We're going through this? So, I mean, we went through a spell this summer for, how many weeks was that? I think it was three weeks. It never got below 90 degrees night times. It was all during the pollination window of corn, and it hurt us bad on corn, and our corn yields, even though we had enough moisture, we were way off on numbers. Irrigated corn was off 60, 80 bushel an acre from normal, average. But our dry land corn was up. So overall average, we're probably the same as what we were on any other given year. Soybeans, I'd say, all in all, there were some guys up north of here that said that their beans were above average. But for us in this area, I'd say that we're all in all, we're pretty much average of, what, of what's the norm. There were some 70 bushel beans out there, maybe scratching some 80 bushel beans. But for the most part, all of them fell lower. You know, we had a lot of rain, we had a lot of growth. You know, the in between the pod sets, was it's too much. I mean, they grew, 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 and it, like, it was all this vegetation, and it just wasn't enough reproductive going on there. And that's where a lot of our problems set in there. The contest beans that we had, they were good, but they was, the stalks were bigger around than my thumb. They looked like corn plants. They were humongous. But, and we actually had a lot of trouble cutting them with the John Deere combine because it's got the little small sickles on it and it wouldn't cut them, he kept pushing them over. So we had to cut them with the MacDon head and had to cut them all one way because they laid one way, the stalk was big and you had to get up underneath of it to get it cut or else you just push them right over. It was like a 15 bushel difference running one way versus coming the other way. So I cut the whole plot one way. Had to, it was terrible. It's just been one fight after the other. Nothing has been smooth. And fighting the mud all year long. We had a lot of heat at first, but that was early on. And then, you know, we were having them terrible heat storms. And I mean, when it would rain, I mean, it come. And then we got a lot of drowned out. There's some drowned out spots right here. Like, it's just gone. There's a ton of that and they're everywhere. You get a bunch of those zeros in the field, it's hard to make that up on an average. Yeah. 